Welcome to the CEO.com show. My name is Clint Betts. On today's show, I talk to Coastal CEO Eric Berridge, who is a two-time author, TED speaker, and co-founder and former CEO of Blue Wolf, an IBM company that was acquired in 2016. That was a firm that he built over two decades as the original, the original, and we talk about this, and his relationship with Mark Benioff, the CEO of Salesforce. They were the original and preeminent consultancy for Salesforce. Today, Eric is the CEO of Coastal, used to be called Coastal Cloud, which again is a top Salesforce consultancy. Uh, he knows what he's doing in this. He's actually written two books. His, his latest book is Customer Obsessed, which redefines customer obsession for the tech era. And he continues to educate and give voice to other entrepreneurs building customer obsessed businesses. We get pretty deep here on customer obsessions. It, it, this was a really fascinating, um, in-depth interview. If you're really interested in how do you give your customers the very best experience possible. Eric, Eric knows a lot about that. And so... Let's talk to him. Eric, thank you so much for coming on the show. Uh, it's an honor to have you. You recently went through a rebrand, which which we're seeing now here with Coastal. Um, I love it. I was on your site actually earlier today. Well done. What what all went into this rebrand? And maybe you could help us like understand branding in general and how you think about what you, how, how a brand tells a company's story? Yeah, that's a great question, Clint. Um, you know, our company's been around for over a decade and it started out as Coastal Cloud. It was back when the cloud was still relatively new and it wasn't as ubiquitous in the marketplace as it is today. So it was a, a differentiator for us. We were also founded in Florida and Palm Coast, Florida, uh, which is a place a lot of people haven't been, not to be confused with Palm Beach, Florida, mm -hmm. uh, founded by Tim and Sarah Hale. And, you know, they started as this local company and employed a lot of people locally in the Palm Coast area. They did a lot of work with Salesforce, obviously, but also with the state of Florida around things like emergency management and contact tracing and vaccine management during COVID. And the company really blew up and became a national organization uh, over the course of that decade, uh, became one of Salesforce's top partners. And our brand actually was kind of stuck behind what we'd actually become. Like we were now doing pro programs and projects with eight different industries uh, across a vast uh, array of Salesforce clients, multi-cloud, complex implementations. We have a team of over 600 people now nationally running these programs, but our brand still looked like we were founded by this couple in Florida uh, on the beach. And so for us, the branding exercise was really an evolution and dropping the cloud from our name uh, really just made the statement that the cloud is how people operate today. Uh, it's not something that we have to declare. Uh, and we're coastal and we're coast to coast. And we're the top provider of services in the Salesforce ecosystem in North America. Uh, it was a really fun process. Yeah, that's incredible. And well done. Again, I I, I think it looks beautiful and, and the site looks great as well. Um Tell us about what it means to be the top Salesforce provider in North America. Uh, it's really all about what your customers say about you. And, you know, if you go on Salesforce's app exchange or you go on to independent third-party research sites like G2, uh, they consistently rank us number one and they rank us number one based on the satisfaction that they have around our services around the number of certified consultants that we have in the marketplace in North America, uh, as well as the various skill sets that we bring to the table. As, as you know, Salesforce is not just one product, it's a portfolio of products. It's actually hundreds of products. So to maintain skills across that portfolio in a broad enough way to serve a, an enterprise client, 
uh, requires us to have those skills on staff. And we're 100% onshore. Uh, all of our folks are certified. Uh, we're W-2 based organizations, so we use very few contractors. And you know those things put together with really what customers say about us on these sites and, and in the marketplace is what puts us in that number one position. And you've written a book called Customer Obsessed, and you also have a podcast of the same name, if I'm not mistaken. And um, what does it mean to be customer obsessed? Because obviously that's been successful and whatever strategy you're using has been successful being ranked number one in all these different categories. What does it mean to be customer obsessed? Uh, it probably means that you're really annoying. <laughs> and what do I mean by that? Like we all live our lives as consumers and I'm probably the most annoying consumer there is because if a brand shows me something or takes me through a process that isn't incredibly intuitive and that doesn't immediately get me engaged or interested, I'm pointing it out, right? Like I'm the type of consumer that I hate it when someone hands me a receipt. I, I don't need a receipt. Yeah. You know, who <laughs> I am. you know what I just bought. I want that transaction to flow seamlessly, right? So if you're customer obsessed, you are looking for every single nook and cranny in your customer journey, and you're doing everything within your power to iron it out, to shorten the cycle, to make that process seamless. Um, you know, and, and if you go back to the beginning of the internet and you look at something like when, when Amazon first came out with one-click ordering, that was like a seminal moment. Yeah, for sure. It used to take you 20 minutes to buy something online. Now it took you eight seconds, right? So... Being customer obsessed is just looking for opportunities to improve customer experience at every single step of the way. And, and it can be annoying, right? Like we consumers and buyers and brands, like they tend to accept mediocrity, but the best brands, the best experiences come from organizations that don't accept mediocrity. They come from organizations where there tends to be a leader that is obsessed with defining the value that their customer is getting, is obsessed with the packaging, is obsessed with the colors in their logo. Like, you know, it's it's a full package, but being customer obsessed is all about being incredibly obsessed about how organizations experience your brand. Who do you think does that really well? Like what brands stick out to you as like an example of like, hey, these, they'd make this experience awesome uh, they're obsessed with their customer and they care about everything they put out. Are there any uh, brands that kind of immediately stick out in your mind? I mean, they're the obvious ones like Apple. I mean, they invented this whole concept, right? Like, sure. you know, Steve Jobs, may he rest in peace, would look at everything through the customer lens. And then you have organizations like uh, Zappos early on to find themselves around the customer. Uh, I think Salesforce does a great job. Uh, you know, they are... You know, one of the biggest metrics that Salesforce looks at internally, and I spent two years inside of Salesforce, I've been in the ecosystem for over 20, is their attrition. Like it's a metric that matters to them and they measure it daily. Like, are we losing customers? Why are we losing customers? And they tend to back up the truck with resources to make sure that customers stay on their platform. And this is a highly complex platform that can be difficult to use because it's so powerful. So I think they're a great example. Um, you know, the local bookstore is a great example. Like yeah. what experience are you actually looking for? I don't like trolling through catalogs of digital images sometimes when I'm trying to buy something. Like I want to go into a warm environment and actually speak to someone about, have you read this book or have you heard about this author? Or so, you know, there, there are, consumer experiences that are in our daily lives. And we tend to get so focused on digital, but let's remember that those brick and mortar experiences are really important ones as well. You know, and going back to Apple for a second, when Apple first opened the Apple store, they at opened it in a period of time when everything was going online. When Dell was the darling of Wall Street selling boxes that were made to order over the internet, click to buy, and 
Apple announces they're going to open the Apple store. Their stock went down like 10% that day. Like, what are you doing? Like, you're going back to brick and mortar. Well, it's, Apple knew that like you have to have a multi-channel approach to a customer. Um, so, and that's another big piece of being customer obsessed is like meet the customer where they want to meet you and think about a multi-channel approach. And that will lead you to probably come to the conclusion that brick and mortar isn't dead. Yeah. Yeah. I, th I think there's a lot of truth to that actually. As CEO of Coastal, how do you decide where to spend your time? Is it always like what wins each day? Is it, you know, customers like, Hey, how do we improve the customer experience? Does that win every day? And so that kind of dictates how you're going to be spending your time and where in the company you're going to be spending your time. I think that's a good way of looking at it. Uh, I think that the, the view of, you know, just give your customers what they want though, is not the right way to look at it particularly as a consultancy, it's our responsibility to lead the horse to water. It's our responsibility to promote ways of working and best practices to clients that will ultimately deliver the best customer experience. And that sometimes flies in the face of expectations that clients have at the outset. So we spend a lot of time helping our teams to have the tougher conversations with clients to get them to see the light from time to time. You have to remember as a consulting firm, a lot of times we're dealing with a multifaceted organization and they're bringing different departments at us, right? You might have the sales department, the IT department, legal might be involved. In any engagement, we're probably dealing with a couple dozen people at a minimum and they all have different views and they're not perfectly aligned. So getting to true customer success is helping to build that alignment with that organization using our experience and best practices in a way where it's collaborative and it's positive and there are results that we're all trying to achieve that we're aligned around. Uh, and we end, ultimately get to an end goal, right? Which is a go live or is a, the realization of the ROI that the project set out to achieve. So, you know, back to your question, which is where do I choose to spend my time? You know, waking up every morning, thinking about customers and knowing where our customer opportunities are uh, is certainly one way where I prioritize my time. Uh, but I also prioritize my time a lot around like how we're gonna deliver these experiences to our customers on a consistent basis. What do you read? What reading recommendations would you have for us? Well, every morning I do Wordle and Connections. Perfect. That's how I start my day. That's like how I get my brain. Like uh, that's my own meditation. And you know, I I in the morning I'll read you know various quote unquote newspapers. Like I I'm a big fan of the New York Times. I read the San Francisco Chronicle because I'm originally from the Bay Area. I do all that online. You know, I look at what's going on in the market. Um, I read things like The Atlantic and The New Yorker, which tend to be longer time commitments, but will touch upon topics that are very relevant. Like there's so much out there on AI right now mm -hmm. that you can always find a good article that's a great perspective on where are we really going with AI. Um, I read about our customers and I love to read fiction. You know, I'm a big fan of American fiction. I'm a big fan of F. Scott Fitzgerald, Ernest Hemingway, Nathaniel oh, Hawthorne. Yeah. The greats. Yeah. And the, and, and the older I get and the longer I've been in the business world, I've been at this now for 30 plus years. When you go back and read that stuff, like you realize there are so many business lessons in the great works of fiction. Even in just the way like Hemingway wrote, for example, using him as an example, like the simplicity of it and the beauty of the simplicity of it and the way like you can really make a point and get things across without having to be super like he would write in two sentences what a lot of authors, particularly back then, would use three pages for. Yeah, I'll never forget my high school English teacher. There was, uh, we were reading Hemingway short stories and there was one that was uh, called Up in Michigan. 
And there was a line that he made us read like 10 times and I could never figure out why. And the sentence was, Nick looked at the fish, period. <laughs> and he was just trying to show us that Hemingway used brevity. He, he, he economized words to get messages across. And that's incredibly relevant to business today. Because yeah, it really is. This whole thing is communication exercise. Yeah. Getting people to communicate with each other. And the better you do it, and the more efficiently you do it, the faster you grow, the more customers you have, like the tighter your messages are, the more you can get groups of people to align around a common vision, uh, which is about communication. You know, we spend so much time in the corporate world right now, sitting behind screens, looking at PowerPoint presentations that are riddled with bullet points and abbreviations and acronyms, and they're wordy, and no one's really reading it because you're looking at the slide, but you're listening to what someone's saying, so you're confused. You know, if, if, people, if people can get to the point and articulate things uh, in a more concise way, with persuasion, we'll get more done. Yeah, and you mentioned Apple before, but nobody's better than that at Apple with the brevity and the simplicity, but still a powerful message that comes out of that. that that's actually really fascinating. I, I agree with that. People need to read Hemingway. Like, yeah, if you, yeah that's that's, an answer. we just came up with a solution here, Glenn. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> go read Hemingway. Why not? It's incredible. He's an incredible writer. Maybe the greatest ever, actually. Uh, hey, you mentioned earlier that you've been reading a lot about AI in, in The Atlantic and New Yorker and other publications. Um, what's your take on it? How is it affecting your business? How is it affecting the businesses of your customers? Yeah, I mean, it's been coming for a long time. Uh, you know, I spent some time inside of IBM for about three and a half years. And IBM was ahead of the curve on this stuff with Watson. The challenge back then was people's data. It was everywhere. And I think obviously last year with the launch of ChatGPT, we that was another seminal moment where the world woke up to AI. Uh, it's incredibly powerful. Um, I'm not one of these individuals that's worried about the displacement of jobs. I think it's actually going to be the opposite. Uh, there's a lot of research that shows that if we can start using these AI models correctly, it's just going to increase productivity dramatically, which is going to increase creativity dramatically. You know, it's if you look at the history of time going back to pre-industrial revolution, and we're just doing things faster as a society. And we are dishing the work that is less value add, if you will, to automation, right? Like, all right, talking about writing a press release, like, you know, that can take a PR department a week. Well, it could take Ch chat GPT five seconds, yeah. plus some editing, plus some revisions, plus some, some criticism from the team. But if we're shortening those cycles, it means more communication. It means that we now can put our brains to work at bigger problems. And I'm just, I'm a big believer in it. I think organizations are going to struggle to adopt it correctly because it is the wild, wild west right now. And there'll be a lot of failure. Yeah. Um, hopefully none of that or very little of it will be um, too dramatic. But, you know, in the early internet days, people failed putting shopping carts up. It was hard. So to truly apply AI to your business correctly is still going to take a lot of thought and leadership and adoption, but it's powerful. Yeah. Don't you think like people who, you know, are like, this is going to take away jobs and maybe it will, but it, it also like would create jobs, right? That's what every major technology has ever done in the history of the world is it's taken jobs, but it's also created far more jobs than it, than it took. Um, don't you think like those who are like, AI can replace employees are thinking about it wrong. And you, you basically just said this in a different way, but like AI is like a tool for those employees to be more productive. It's not a replacement as much as it's an enhancer. Yeah. Well, and look, I think something else that, that I'm really passionate about is 
we're going to know when AI wrote something versus when something is really original. We just yeah. will. Like we're humans. Like we, we, we're pretty good at, at identifying things. And like, I think the power in brand in the world of AI will be around authenticity. That's what we're going to buy. Right. And if AI can do all the stuff that gets us ready to be incredibly authentic as a brand or as a person or an employee or a parent, awesome. Right. Like we want to be our true selves at work. We want to be our true selves in our daily lives. And, and that's what people are going to buy. That's going to make people successful. It's going to make us better communities. So, you know, the, the, that's the trick. It's funny. My daughter's a college student or one of my daughters. And I asked her, so I have a, I have a son who's a computer science major and a daughter who is a liberal, liberal arts major. And I asked my son, like, do you use chat GPT to do your homework? He said, yes, absolutely. I do dad. Mm-hmm. Okay. Cool. Uh, I asked my daughter, like, do you use it to write a paper? And she said, no, I can't. She said, it takes me more time to rewrite what AI does for me than it does for me just to do it myself. Now she's a writer. Her true self is to be authentic through her words, right? So that's how she's expressing her authentic self. He's just trying to get work done. Yeah. You know, we're going to pick and choose our spots, but I think authenticity is, is still going to be this, this characteristic that we're going to seek out. You gave a Ted talk actually kind of about what you just mentioned where, um, you know, we should be looking at the arts and humanities for talent and not just from the STEM uh, fields uh, as we work in technology and as technology progresses. Like, I think that that will become more and more important. Well, right, because AI is going to provide a lot of our, it's going to be the basis for our technology. It's going to become our interface, right? Yeah. You can tell a machine how to program something. If you can tell a machine what you want, you know, I think that, and I'm not saying there aren't jobs out there for engineers or computer programmers or architects or like this stuff is still like wildly complicated. <laughs> yeah. Just, AI can do it faster. It's like, okay, it's going to crash the car faster too if you have a bad architecture. Right. So I'm not suggesting that, but I am suggesting that if you have, communication skills, if you can write concisely, like we talked about a few minutes ago, if you can persuade, right? How do you get a group of 60 people to agree where you're going to go on the hike? Right? Like organizational skills, community building skills, um, having vision, being able to express passion, right? Like these are the things that will drive an automated world. And emotion becomes way more important in the workplace when the machine's doing all the rote tasks. Yeah. That's why an education in the humanities, or that's why, you know, if you want to be a poet in college, go for it. Cause there'll be jobs out there for you. I truly believe that. And it, it, it pains me when I see, certain universities or schools like cut the budget to the, to the liberal arts or the humanities because everything is going STEM, you know, what kind of people are we putting in the world? Like we need that mix. We need that diversity and the workplace, you know, the, everyone we hire nowadays that's in their early twenties, they're all digital natives. Anyhow, like, you know, if you'd given a, in 1972, if you had given a, uh, COBOL programmer and iPhone, they would have been lost. Yeah. <laughs> right? But we bring someone into Coastal today that's a history major. We can teach them Salesforce in about two weeks. And that's a true story. Now, do they have the business skills yet to be a top producer in our organization? Not yet, but we can teach them the technology much faster today than you could 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 30 years ago. So that's kind of my whole, that's how I feel about the importance of a broad-based education. 
How have you handled this whole work from home hybrid or uh, everybody back at the office that every leader said to go through post pandemic? No one's figured it out. It's a problem, actually. There's an opportunity for for people. I just had this conversation with an ex colleague of mine today. Like, like I'm at home right now. That's cool. I had probably eight meetings today on Zoom. We all like looked at each other on our screens. But there was very little extemporaneous creativity that happened in my day today. I didn't bump into someone in the hall and get quickly caught up on what's going on in their lives or in their department. I didn't come up with that idea. I didn't grab someone, bring them into my office and whiteboard an issue we're having right now. Like that is the power of collaboration and organizations are stuck right now because it's kind of like a, there are either organizations that are like, you can work from home wherever you, whenever you want, or there are organizations that are saying you have to be back in the office three days a week. And in this generation, a mandate of anything never works. I mean, just try to ask your kid to go do something. They'll do the opposite. Um, there's an opportunity for organizations to build physical environments that people want to go to specifically to collaborate in the manner that I just described. And I haven't seen it really happen anywhere yet. Um, it's, it's kind of where we want to try to take coastal over time without mandating anything. Cause I do think, you know, there are certain times when you just get more done when you're together as a team. Yeah. And you, certainly yeah. Have, you certainly have more fun. So how do you define culture and how do you manage culture given that, um, you know, we're not all on the office every single day. It's harder to do it in a remote environment. When you get people together, the relationships they build, the bonds they make are lifelong. Um, and so we we plot those things out. You know, we do we do a ton of stuff like this, but we all know when our next get together is. You know, we do an all hands event every year with when the entire company comes in. We just planned that out a couple of weeks ago. Uh, but we don't have a traditional office culture. Now, I will say the other thing you need to do more consistently if you don't have an office-based environment is you have to clearly define your values and you have to constantly remind people what those values are. And you manage the culture around how we how true we are to those values, if that makes sense. Yeah, for sure. What are Coastal's values? They're simple, respect, innovation, collaboration, have fun, you know, they're, they're, but, but we talk about them and, and we, and we, we highlight them on a monthly basis. As we talk about customers, we kind of try to tie a value to a customer narrative. As CEO, how do you handle this? Like, um, kind of responsibility it feels like or maybe it's real maybe it isn't where you know you're being asked to comment on more than just what's happening inside of your company but what's happening in the world at large how do you how do you think about that how do you manage that how do you decide when you're going to speak about something that really doesn't have anything to do with coastal um but your employees care about your community cares about all that type of stuff I think it's that's those are the powerful stories you want to try to relate to the company, right? And and you also have to, you know, I think, and I struggle with this sometimes, but I think great CEOs are always inclusive, and it's never about them. You know, it's really about the employees. So if you're going to use examples or stories from the outside world, you have to pick ones that you're pretty confident there's a commonality across the organization. And, and the story you pick isn't, doesn't exclude, right? Like I'm a huge golf fan. I've been playing golf since I was a, a little boy. And I did tell a story last week to the whole company uh, about the masters. But I picked that because I was like, you know what? This is the one golf tournament that pretty much everyone has at least heard of. And I'm not going to look like, 
you know, I'm picking this sport that no one knows about. We also talked about the women's uh, basketball, the NCAA basketball tournament that happened a couple of weeks ago. We talked about Caitlin Clark, like, and why is, and we talked about the South Carolina coach too, uh, whose name escapes me right now, but that was a current event that I was pretty confident everyone had at least seen an Instagram post on or yeah. something. And we talked about teamwork and we actually compared Caitlin Clark. Why did South Carolina win? And as great as Iowa was, and as great as Caitlin Clark was, South Carolina played like a team. Their bench scored 41 points in that game. Their bench scored 41 points. I was bench scored zero. Yeah. So we kind of related that to teamwork. And when you're running a program with a client, make sure the whole team's involved and make sure you're passing the ball because that's what's going to deliver the most value and the best ideas. I think but South Carolina outside narratives are key. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think the South Carolina's coach is Don Staley, if I'm not mistaken. That's right. I, I, I believe. Hey, you have this podcast, um, customer obsessed. What do you talk about on there? What is it? What is it like? Promote it we, for us. Yeah. Well, we try to look. I, we're not getting like headline actors on our podcast. Like this is, I try to find people in my network and in my walk of life that I just think have great stories and have had interesting journeys. And we always relate it to the customer. We talk a lot about career paths and leadership and how to grow in an organization. You know, I try to point things out to our listeners that they might not know about certain industry trends. Like we had a wonderful guest on a, a month ago, Melanie Husk, who's the CMO of Baptist Health down in Florida. And we just talked about how health organizations market themselves. Like most consumers don't think of health organizations as having big marketing organizations, uh, but health organizations market themselves. And she talked about how she uses technology to do that. And she's also been there for almost 20 years. So how do you survive in a big organization that long and, and still stay passionate? We talk a lot about passion. We, we look for funny stories. You know, what, what, what happened in your business life that was just off the wall that had an impact on you? Who, who are great mentors you have? We try to keep it pretty casual. That's cool. But it's, well, not, it's not the A-line, the headline guests. Like, the, you know, where this is like, Monday night at the comedy club. But I, I, I love that. You know, yeah, that's incredible. That's super people, cool. right? Oh, for sure. We'll put the link to your podcast in the show notes here so that people can check it out. Um, Thank you. Speaking of like mentors and people have given you a chance, we end every interview with this, with this question. And that is at CEO.com. We believe the chances one gives are just as important as the chances one takes. And when you hear that, <clears throat> sorry, when you hear that, who gave you a chance to get you to where you are today? I mean, Mark Benioff, who, I mean, I was this little peon at Oracle right out of college. I had no idea what I was doing. And we kind of connect. He was working at Oracle at the time too, several levels above me. And we connected over something and he, I think he just recognized that I needed some guidance and he literally took me to lunch one day, you know, and his, I won't even tell you what kind of car it was, but I was driving mm -hmm. like a old Acura Integra and, uh, he took me in his car. It was much nicer. Um, but we kind of stayed in touch and I ran into him several years later, right when he was starting Salesforce, I was in New York. I'd moved from the West coast to New York city. Ha we happened to run into him and he encouraged me to start a consulting firm around Salesforce. And this was before anyone knew what Salesforce was. This was when they were probably 50 people in San Francisco. And so he's always been a big, idol of mine and mentor of mine. And we've done a lot together over the years, but there are a lot more too, like giving back. Like I get a lot of gratitude when people come to me or I, I, I feel a lot of gratitude when people come to me and ask for advice or, you know, need career advice, because first of all, I'm flattered. Um, but second of all, you know, as you move on in your career, you realize that the people that helped you, like you need to become that person. So I love that. What What's the tagline? I get it. We, we, the chances one gives uh, are just as important as the chances one takes. Yeah, I, I believe in that 100%.
I, I also had an interesting, like, at least for me, career development. And then I started my career in the Bay area and then I really flourished in New York and combining the, like that West coast attitude with the East coast attitude and looking at those different, like culture nuances kind of, I think helped me understand customers better across a, a, a broader spectrum. Um, and it certainly helped me with my career because I was a little bit of a fish out of water in New York being in the technology space because everyone yeah. was in this state. So it was a differentiator. Are you still in New York? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's great. That's very cool. Uh, hey, Eric, thank you so much. Seriously, that, that was incredible. And um, again, we'll link to your podcast and your book and all that type of stuff. Everyone check out Coastal. Thanks, Eric. Thanks for coming on. Well, thank you for having me and uh, best of luck. I love your show. Likewise. Thank you so much.